This evening, Books and Books is very happy to present Mr. Tim Johnston and his new novel, Descent. Mr. Johnston holds degrees from the University of Iowa and the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. He is the author of the multiple award-winning story collection, Irish Girl, and the young adult novel, Never So Green. His stories have also appeared in New England Review, New Letters, the Iowa Review, the Missouri Review, Double Take, Best Life Magazine, and Narrative Magazine, among others. In this book, he tells us the story of the Cortlands, who are taking a family vacation in the Rocky Mountains before their daughter leaves for college. But when Caitlin and her younger brother, Sean, go out for an early morning run and only Sean returns, the mountains become as terrifying as they are majestic. Here to tell us more about it, please give a very warm welcome to Mr. Tim Johnston. Thank you very much. Thanks, Victor. Thank you for coming out. Um, such a inclement weather. Um, I parked my, you'd be glad to know I parked my truck in a frozen over long-term parking lot this morning in Iowa. And uh, when I got off on the plane here, it was like, uh, all right, I overdressed. <laughs> um, I forgot that this was going out live to internet. I'm very nervous suddenly of thinking all those people out there watching me. Um, I've also never done a reading with a dog in the audience, so that's very <laughs> exciting. Uh, well, fortunately, I chose, I didn't bring a lot of material, and fortunately, I chose a section that is very, um, well, it's not dog unfriendly. There's no dog in it whatsoever, I don't think. There is a section in the book that's not very, not very pleasant for a dog, but um, thankfully, I didn't bring that. So um, also, I'd just like to say what a pleasure it is to be in this bookstore. You guys have the greatest bookstore, like one of the greatest bookstores I've ever seen. Um, no wonder you know, it was Publishers Weekly, Publisher Weekly's choice for 2015 Best Bookstore. Very impressive and very well run, clearly and um, some very good-looking clientele, I have to say. <laughs> shameless, shameless. Uh, so, yeah, you know, I think Victor's introduction said pretty much all you need to know about uh, the setup for the book. And um, fortunately for you, I'm, I'm going to start at the very beginning, so I don't have to set up anything more. Um, I'm going to read a few pages of the beginning, and then I'm going to jump ahead to a section that is a little out of order, but I think it'll make sense to you when I read it. So I shouldn't have to prepare anything. But I will tell you the names. There's Caitlin. Her little Caitlin is the daughter who's 18. There's her little brother who is 15, Sean. Um, there's the father who is Grant and the mother who is Angela. And when Sean and Caitlin go up into the mountains on that first day on their vacation, uh, of course, Grant and Angela stay behind in the hotel room. And... I think that's about all you need to know. So, fingers crossed. I don't. I haven't read this in a while, so if I screw it up, uh, only uh, it'll only be on record forever. <laughs> her name was Caitlin. She was 18, and her own heart would sometimes wake her, flying away in that dream in that dream race where finish lines grew farther away, not nearer, where knees turned to taffy or feet to stones. Lurching awake under the sheets, her chest squeezed in phantom arms, she'd lie there gasping, her eyes open to the dark. She'd lift her hands and press the watch face into bloom, blue as an eye in which blinked all the true data of her body, dreaming or awake. Heart rate, 86 beats per minute, body temp, 37.8 degrees Celsius, pace, zero, altitude, 9,015 feet. Altitude, 9,015 feet. She looked around the room at the few dark furnishings shaped by a thin light in the seams of the drapes. To her left in the other bed lay her mother, a wing of blonde hair dark on the white pillow. In the adjoining room on the other side of the wall slept her father and brother. Two rooms, four beds, no discussion. She would not share a room with her 15-year-old brother, nor he with her. The watch face burned again with its cool light and began to beep, and she pinched it into silence. She checked her heart. Still fast, but it wasn't the dream anymore. 
It was the air at 9,015 feet, the Rocky Mountains. When she'd seen them for the first time from the car, her heart had begun to pump, and the muscles of her legs had tightened and twitched. In a few weeks, she would begin college on a track scholarship. And although she had not lost a race in her senior year, Cortland undefeated ran the headline, she knew that the girls at college would be faster and stronger, more experienced and more determined than the girls she was used to running against. And she'd picked the mountains for no other reason. In the bathroom, she washed her face and brushed her teeth and banded her ponytail tight to her head and then stood staring into the mirror. It wasn't vanity. She was looking to see what was in this girl's eyes, as she would any girl, so she would know how to defeat her. She stepped back into the room, and for a moment, she thought her mother was awake, watching her from the bed. But it was only the eyelids, pale and round in that dim light, a blind, unnerving effect, like the gazes of statues. And Caitlin opened the connecting door and stepped from one room into another exactly like it and shook the boy awake. The sun was still climbing the far side of the mountains, and the town waited in a cold lake of shadow. The black bears that came down at night to raid the garbage bins and lope along the sidewalks had all gone back up. The streets were empty. No one to see the two of them passing under the traffic light. No one but them to hear the slow blink blink of its middle eye. Come on in. There are seats. You haven't missed much. It's just the beginning. It's, everyone knows what happens in the beginning anyway. You just missed some very choice prose is all. <laughs> Flawlessly delivered in front of millions. It's like missing the opening call of Star Wars. That's, yeah, that's right. I did. We'll talk about it afterwards. <laughs> and, and, no, and, nothing, and nothing else. So the sun was still climbing the far side of the mountains, and the town waited in a cold lake of shadow. The black bears that came down at night to raid the garbage bins and lope along the sidewalks had all gone back up. No one to see the two of them, the streets were empty. No one to see the two of them uh, passing under the traffic light. No one but them to hear the slow blink blink of its middle eye. Caitlin was not yet running, but high stepping in a brisk pantomime of it, like a drum majorette for a parade consisting of the boy alone, wobbling along behind her on the rented bike. The boy wanted to go back for sweatshirts, but it was July, she reminded him. It would warm up. His name was Sean, but she called him Dudley, a long-ago insult which had lost its meaning. They'd come, into, they'd come into town the day before, up from the plains on the interstate, up through Denver, and then into the mountains on a swinging cliff of road that swung their hearts out into the open sky, into dizzy plungings of bottomless green, the pines so thick and small on the far slopes. Up and up they'd climbed, up to the Great Divide, and then down again, down to 9,000 feet, where the resort village appeared suddenly in the high geography like a mirage. The wintry architecture of ski shops and coffee houses at midsummer. Chairlifts hanging empty over the grassy runs. Impossible colors at this height, and air like they had never breathed before. Now, in the blue morning, they drew this air into their lungs and coughed up white clouds. The smell of pine was like Christmas. Here we go, Caitlin said. And she turned onto a road called Ermine and began to run in earnest, and the boy followed. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here, going back to the hotel. <coughs> the phone is just rung, and uh, Grant is going to answer it. He raised the phone and said, hello, Sean. And a man's voice said, is this Mr. Cortland? And Grant's head jerked as if struck. Yes, who is this? At these words, the change in his body, Angela came around to see his face. He met her eyes and looked away out the window. The man on the phone identified himself in some detail, but all Grant heard was the word sheriff. What's happened, he asked. Where's Sean? There was a pain in his forearm, and he looked to see the white claw fastened there. He pried at it gently. He's here at the medical center in Granby, Mr. Cortland, said the sheriff. He's a tad banged up, but the doctor says he'll be fine. I found his wallet and his phone in his, what do you mean a tad? Grant glanced at Angela and stopped himself. What do you mean by that? 
I mean, it looks like he got himself in some kind of accident, accident up there on the mountain, Mr. Cortland. I ain't had a chance to talk to him yet. They doped him up pretty good for the, well, you can talk to the doctor in a second here, but first, but he's all right, Grant said. Oh, he's, uh, his legs banged up pretty good, but he was wearing that helmet. He'll be all right. He had some good luck up there. What do you mean? I mean, he could have laid there a lot longer, but it happened some folks came by on their bikes. Grant's heart was hammering in his skull. He couldn't think. His son, lying there, up there on the mountain, hurt. Mr. Cortland, said the sheriff, where are you all at? There was something in the man's tone. Grant shook his head. What do you mean? Well, sir, we found your boy way up there on the mountain on a rental bike, so I'm just wondering, sir, where you're at. Caitlin, Angela said suddenly. And Grant's heart leapt, and he said, yes, let me speak to my daughter. Let me speak to Caitlin. Your daughter, said the other man, then was silent. In the silence was the sound of his breathing, the sound of him making an adjustment to his sheriff's belt, the sound of a woman's voice paging unintelligibly down the empty hospital corridor. When he spoke again, he sounded like some other man altogether. Mr. Cortland, he said, and Grant stepped toward the window as though he'd walk through it. He'd taken the representations of the mountains on the resort maps with their colorful tracery of runs and trails and lifts as the mountains themselves. Less mountains than playgrounds fashioned into the shapes of mountains by men and money. Now he saw the things themselves, so green and massive, humped one upon the other like a heaving sea. Angela stopped him physically with her thumbs in his biceps she raised on her toes that she might hear every word. Mr. Cortland, said the sheriff, your son came in alone. Okay, so that's that gripper beginning. I know, you're all hooked. So um, I should just stop there. But I'm not going to give out too much away about... Um, uh, what happens next because it sort of just jumps over to uh, another period of time. It's kind of a, what you call a flashback, I guess, in the narrative. They carried the walkie-talkies and they carried their phones and they remembered a show they'd once watched about a girl locked in an underground bunker texting her mother. Remembered their own daughter sitting between, the, between them then, a thin and budding girl of 12 in summer pajamas, bare knees drawn to her chest, smelling of her bath, riveted. And they played and replayed the one message from Caitlin, the last one, her voice breaking on the single word, the sound of an engine in the background, and the sound of wind, and then a sound like the phone dropping, and then the silence. Daddy, she'd said. But they had not heard her, had not heard the call. They'd been in bed. They'd been having sex. In those first days, those early disbelieving days in the mountains, they did not hold each other and they did not weep in bed at night. They spoke of what had been done that day and what must be done the next day and who was going to do it. Who would sit with Sean at the hospital and who would take sandwiches to the volunteers and who would get more posters printed and who would contact the school back home and who would meet with the sheriff or the FBI men or the reporters again and who would go to the laundromat a, grot a grotesque fever dream of the domestic. And when they had talked themselves to exhaustion, when sleep was coming at last, Angela would pull them back to pray. She would pray aloud, and she wanted Grant to pray aloud too. And he would in those early days, though it made him nearly sick, the sound of his own voice, the sound of those words in the cheap little room. Days into weeks, Grant wheeled Sean out of the hospital and the three of them took two rooms on the ground floor of the motel, and those rooms were now home and headquarters. Papers and supplies and lists and maps on every surface. In town, when a poster came down, Angela somehow knew, and the poster was restored. Weeks into months. In early, in early November, Sean turned 16. They remembered two days later and went out for pizza. Angela's calls began to be returned less promptly and sometimes not at all. And when she called the sheriff, she was no longer put right through, but had to speak to a deputy first. And often the sheriff was not in. 
nor was he up in the mountains searching some unsearched quadrant of forest. Such helicopters that sounded overhead, the sound of urgency itself in those throbbing blades of all-out human and mechanical response, massively adept, beat across the sky towards some other purpose. It may not just be a case of a needle in a haystack, the sheriff told Grant. It may not even be the right haystack. How do you mean? I mean a smart man don't steal a pony from his neighbor, pardon the analogy. You mean he might not be local, this man. I mean a man, a man might drive quite a ways looking for just the right pony. They'd come to the Rockies thinking it was a place like any, the, any other they might have chosen, chronicled, mapped, finite, a fully known American somewhere. Now Grant, un, now Grant understood that, like the desert, like the ocean, the mountains were a vast and pitiless nowhere. Who would bring his family, his children, to this place? He returned to the motel and checked with Sean in front of the TV and then stepped into the other room and shut the door and went to her where she sat at the desk staring at the laptop. Angie, he needs to go home. What do you mean? He needs, he needs better care for his leg. He needs to be back in school, back with his friends. She turned to look at him. What are you saying? I'm saying it's no good for him, keeping him here. Are you sure you're talking about him? Grant didn't answer. We can't go back now, Grant. You see what's happening here. You see what's going on. One of us can go back with him, he said, for a little while. You mean I can go back? You mean me? I can keep things going here. I can keep Sheriff Joe going, Grant said. And who will keep you going? He stared at her, and she turned away, and she began to shake. Angie. He put his hands on her shoulders. He raised her to her feet and pressed her to his chest. He held her as her legs gave out, then moved her to the bed and eased her down and held her. After a while, she stopped shaking, and he swept the hair from her eyes and kissed the tears up from her cheeks, and he kissed her lips, and she kissed him back, and then she kissed him truly, and something broke in his chest, and kissing her, he put his hands between her legs, and at first she let him, but then suddenly, her thighs tightened and, no, stop it. She shoved at him and fled into the bathroom and slammed the door, and he could hear her in there moaning into a towel. Dad? He got up and opened the connecting door, banging it, banging it into the footrest of the wheelchair. I'm sorry, did I hurt you? Is Mom all right? Yes. What happened? Nothing, Sean. We had an argument. What about? Grant shut the door and went around the wheelchair and sat on the bed. Nothing, just an argument. She woke up that night clutching at him. It's all right, he said. It's all right. No, she said, her eyes bright in the dark. I was driving a dark road, just me, and she came out of the trees into my lights. She was naked and covered in dirt, like she'd been buried alive. But she got out. Oh, God, she got out, and she was trying to come home. He, had, he held his wife until she slept again. Then he lay with his eyes on the ceiling, thinking about that girl in the bunker, the one who texted her mother. Her abductor thought she was just playing games on his phone. He'd kept several girls down there, eventually burying them all nearby. One girl, he said, he'd kept for two years. They were like husband and wife, he said. People wanted to know why. Mothers in ruin begged it of him. The man shook his head. He looked to the courtroom ceiling as a man would to God. It won't help you, he told them. I'm sorry, but it won't. He looked like any other man, this man. Glasses, blue eyes, halfway bald. In prison now, this man. Way back in there, where none of the fathers could touch him. Thanks. Okay, got through that. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that are related to the uh, the book or writing or uh, uh, Miami weather <laughs> <laughs> versus Iowa weather. Mm -hmm.
or we can just all go drink wine. <laughs> what was your initial idea that made you think of the story? I mean, something must have spurred you on, like an artist, you know, something that moves your imagination, yeah. something you read, or... Uh... Yeah, it's interesting, you know, I, I saw a rare, I had a rare, rare sighting of a, my book of, collect short, of short stories out there behind the counter. Um, very nice to see it in a bookstore, but uh, in those stories, I deal a lot with this kind of subject, bad things happening to good people um, for no good reason, random acts of violence, missing people. And I think I was just sort of warming up to this idea when I was writing those stories. They're not all like that. It's not all that grim. But um, so, and then I had stopped writing for a while. I'd written a novel that didn't go anywhere. I didn't like, and nobody else did either. <coughs> but um, I, I was, I've been a carpenter most of my adult life. And so I had gone up to, Cal up to Colorado, up to the Rocky Mountains myself from Iowa and to work on a house that my parents were building up there, kind of a ski vacation house. And I was up there for a long time just sort of alone, you know, with my own thoughts and uh, trying not to chop off my fingers and things like that. And these, uh, this family just sort of began to make themselves known to me. And I didn't know the whole story, but I knew something bad was going to happen. Otherwise, you know, why write a book? Um, and eventually they got so persistent, so nagging, that I, I stopped what I was doing and I started writing. And, and that's where the book came from. It was actually just being up there and having these sort of, still having to work out some of these ideas in a long form. I don't remember particularly. I know there's just been so many of these kinds of stories. She was saved eventually. Oh, was she? Good. Yeah, that's good news. Um, I tried not to, I wasn't doing any kind of research really on any of that kind of stuff. It's just that it's so prevalent in our news. And, and my interest really was in, what really got me writing was not, you know, the sensationalist, sensational idea of a missing woman which has become a kind of genre in itself, which I wasn't really aware of when I began this book. I'll just say in my defense. Um, that was in 2007, so. Um, but uh, what was interesting to me was what happens to the family when it's unresolved, you know, when you don't know one way or another, and, all the, and the newspaper people go away, and the headlines stop, and you're just sort of left with that uncertainty. That was what was interesting to me. Right, yeah, and how it kind of tears this family apart, and they all sort of feel they were kind of, you know, they were kind of, they were kind of a family in trouble before, um, and um, or at least the parents were, uh, and they all feel a little bit sort of a responsibility for what happened in a way. I think especially the son, who wasn't able to help her. Yes, sir. Two-part question. What are your two favorite books? And uh, the second part would be, what's on your nightstand? What's on, okay, what are my two favorite books? And what's on my nightstand? Okay. A glass of water to answer <laughs> to answer the second part. People always. Yeah, I know. And my and my snarky answer to that is I don't read in bed, <laughs> so I don't. I don't because uh, I'm usually been reading all day long by that point. Um, I'm teaching English, I'm teaching creative writing in Memphis, and if I'm not reading their stuff, I'm reading my stuff or somebody else's stuff, and when I go to bed, it's time to just go to bed. So um, the honest answer is, but I know what you're getting at, and what I'm reading right now is a book called um, The Most Dangerous Book, which is a great title. Anybody know it or what it's about? I don't know. It, <laughs> I never remember authors' names unless I, uh, yeah, I wrote it down right here, Tim Johnston. Um, but it's about the, the publishing of Ulysses. You know, it came out during like the Band Book Week or, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the story of how Ulysses almost didn't get published, James Joyce's great novel. Um, and it's very interesting, very interesting, and, and take, it's a, really a cool historical look at the times of, of uh, the early 1900s.
So that's what I'm reading right now. Um, before that, the well, I can't. What fiction book did I read? Um, I read a book called. Um, oh, you know what? Uh, this answers both of your questions. Yeah. No, that no. What I'm about to say. <laughs> the la the fiction book I read before that is a collection or reread, I should say, um, is a collection of short stories called Last Night by James Salter. Anyone heard of James Salter? Great writer, um, especially his stories um, Last Night and the other collection is called Dusk. And I just read him from time to time just to remind me uh, what a crappy writer I am. <laughs> So that's one of my favorite. That's one of my favorites, and uh, a, a book I just read. So I just want to compliment you on your consistent nature of your writing. Thank you. It reminds me uh, in large part of um, Raymond Chandler. Oh, nice. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I would just say, in a general sense, I was I was largely influenced at the time I began writing this by Cormac McCarthy, who I began reading when I was up in the uh, mountains for the first time. All right. So, yes, sir. It's a lot of psychology in your book, but what would you say makes a great villain? Mm. Good question. I think a great villain is a great person. Or by great, I mean complicated person, a real person. Anti-hero, you mean? Not necessarily. Um, there's a difference between an anti-hero and a villain. A villain is still an antagonist, right? I meant fallen hero. Oh. Like, uh, Darth Vader. Oh. <laughs> I got you, but but I'll tell you what. It's a valid question. It's a good question, and what it, what what makes it him interesting is is I think you know the answer is that he had a story, he had a history before he was a villain. He was somebody else. He was somebody's son. Somewhere along the lines, something went terribly, terribly wrong, and I think that's what makes. I don't really, as far as my you know my, if you if you want to consider my characters, I do have a character who's kind of a. Well, I can't go into it really without giving stuff away, but um, you know a lot more about him before you realize what you don't know about him. I hope that answers the question. Yes, sir. How do you go about locating or, or clarifying your intuition? Okay, you're going to have to be a little more specific. <laughs> well, I mean, all writers have to locate an intuition. There's a part. When you're writing something and it comes from someplace else, mm -hmm. next morning you wake up and you go, what did I do last night? Yeah. That. How did you go about that? How does that work for you? Well, I think for me in terms of this book, it has to do with patience. It has to do with um, clearing away the entire day and not trying to write in little fits and starts. I've tried that before and it doesn't work that well. It's about immersion, I think. It's about really trying to live every moment of these characters' day um, as if I was living it. And that's how you access the truth of their lives. You're not skirting over it. You're taking it minute by minute. Now, eventually, a lot of that stuff has to get caught, cut out because it's just too freaking boring. But you, you hang in there until something really cool and genuine and, and true happens. I hope that answers it. That's cool. Thanks. Yes. Something very realistic to try to, like you're saying, this path or the, somewhere the person wants to go on this path. Do you experience that before you write it, or you just most of this comes from your imagination, or do you just do research? Or yeah, I'm just trying to figure yeah. out. Yeah. Okay. No, it's a good question. I'm not a researcher. I, I particularly in terms of characters, I think you have to. I don't like to know too much about them before I begin. Um, I want them to. I know it sounds corny, but I want them to tell me about themselves. When you read a book, sometimes you say, it's supposed to be real, or something. oh, this can't possibly happen. I mean, do you want your book to sound realistic? So is there certain things like the accident? Do you, you know, research how we would fall? And, you know, something yeah. like that. I mean, you have well, to I think very, books. yeah, I, I don't, again, I don't, there's, there's, I, I can't talk about it in detail later in the book. There's something very specific that happens, but but I did have to research it to know how that would happen. But mostly, I, I rely uh, heavily upon the uh, powers of my own imagination to experience things and convey them believably. 
Yes, sir. Where do you get the, the voice for your dialogue to make it uh, impactful and realistic and not sound contrived? Yeah, I think that's a part of the same process of just of listening carefully and time and experience and just uh, reading a lot and knowing, um, taking note when other people do it well, how they do it, what kind of words they leave out, what's the rhythm like. Um, it helps sometimes to read it out loud. Sometimes even when I'm reading now, I think that's kind of, I should have cut that part. Um, and, I, and I would if I could, but uh, uh, I think it's really just, it's part, of, it's part of the writing experience. I think some people have a knack for it, you know, and some don't, I don't know. I've never really given it a lot of thought. I just want it to, um, you know, I just want it to sound real. I don't want it to sound like a play, you know, or a, not a play, a play could sound very real, but uh, I don't know. I want it to sound real, so I just sort of take my time with it and edit it a lot and cut it down to its essentials. And Sure. Did you get a professional editor? Or did you do this yourself or with friends? Or well, I, wrote, I worked on this by myself for an awfully long time, you know, for about seven years. <laughs> and uh, just to tell you a little publishing story, if you, if you want to hear it, um, I finally finished it, and I had, a, I had my agent, who I'd had for many years, and um, I sent it to her, and, you know, she made me wait, wait a couple of weeks or so. But then she called me on, like, a Sunday night which agents never do. And she was very excited. She just finished it. She wanted to send it out right away. And I thought, well, my work is finished, you know. I've uh, I'll just go out and have a giant beer or something and uh wait for the uh wait for the all the accolades to roll in. And you know how this is going to go. So she sent it out to about eight big New York houses. And waited a little longer, not very long, before they started all coming back and turning it down, one after the other. All eight of them. And all of them for different reasons. And what I eventually realized was that in her enthusiasm to send it out, we had sent it out too soon. It wasn't ready. No one but me and her had seen it. No, one, no And she hadn't read it critically. She had, I mean, she'd read it with her critical eye, but she hadn't read it to edit it. And she's really, truth be told, I love her, but she's not that kind of an agent. She doesn't really edit carefully like a real editor. Because she's an agent. But these days, your editor, your agent really has to kind of be an editor. So the long and story short of that is I began looking for a new agent. And um, I found one who not only cared about the editing process, but had her own editor in-house. Well, that's all this person did. She read the incoming stuff, and then she worked with authors as an editor. So we went through that process for like six months. Um, and then when we all thought it was ready to go out again, she sent it to one, my ed agent sent it to one publisher, not eight. And she gave him what is called a preemptive offer, which means only he gets to see it for two weeks, but he has to respond within two weeks. And within a, within a week, he responded that he wanted it. Yeah. So that's the power of re revision and editing, right? Ever considered um, stepping, planning another book to be more, planning any type of, and writing in other genres? I don't know, uh, fantasy maybe? No. Um, but I will say this about genre is that I know this is, talked about as being a thriller and a, you know, a crime novel or what have you, but it was never my intention to write a genre a novel um, without sounding, you know, well, trying not to sound pretentious. Um, all my training was in literary writing. You know, I went to literary, you know, as, as Victor said, I went to the University of Iowa and the University of Massachusetts, and it was all realism, you know, all literary realism. And so it was quite a shock for me to wake up one day and realize that I'd written a thriller. And <laughs> what are you going to do? You write what you want or what you have to write, and then someone else tells you what you wrote. Um, so so I, I would say if I wrote a fantasy novel, it would be by accident. I would be thinking I was writing something else. 
not to say I don't enjoy that kind of writing. I mean, I grew up reading, um, I grew up reading like Stephen King and novels like that, but not science fiction so much. Yes, ma'am. Are you going to be uh, doing a lot of uh, the audio books uh, for some of your novels because? People that drive long distance, that's a wonderful. Hey, man, am I going to do it personally? <laughs> Didn't you just hear me read? <laughs> <laughs> and what are you doing now? Are you still a, a carpentry carpenter? Jeez, you, you know, I was walking over here. At, at the university? <laughs> yeah, okay, I'm going to answer all those questions. First of all, there is an audio, there is an audio version out. I didn't, oh, good, good. I didn't read it, but it is oh, out. Okay. It's been out since the book came out in January. We have to drive so much. We yeah, no, it's good. It's twelve. It's twelve and discs. All over the place. Yeah, you can go. To, you can go a good twelve hours, I think. Oh, on this I don't like Yeah, me. good way to go. Um, especially if you're driving through the Rocky Mountains. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> we have a granddaughter out there in Colorado somewhere. So yeah, there you go. So. Um, I was walking over here and I and there were some guys burning the midnight oil doing some carpentry on a on a on a restaurant around the corner. And I heard the saws going, I smelled the wood, and I thought and I just thought, thank God I don't have to do that anymore. Um, not that teaching's that much greater a gig. It's hard work and it takes a lot away from the writing, but Yeah. Well, I got this book written while I was a carpenter and I haven't written anything as a teacher. <laughs> so <laughs> So, uh, but I am still teaching uh, down in Memphis. I'm teaching the creative writing program down there. And um, I do, I am, I'll answer your next question is yes, I am working on something. Um, it's just going very slowly. Thank you so much, everyone. Let's go have some wine. Okay, folks, so if there are no more questions than a note to our internet audience watching at home, there is still plenty of time for you to call the number on your screen, and we can ship Descent to wherever you are in the U.S. free of charge. For those of you here in the house, we have the book for sale at the counter over there, along with Irish Girl, his award-winning collection of stories. And this has been a terrific event. Please give another hand to Tim Johnson. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tim. Thank you.